How did you come to terms with the idea of reincarnation along with the idea that one goes to Nibbana after death being a reality only if you're enlightened? I don't quite understand. I think the grammar is not quite correct there. Okay, so there's the idea that reincarnation and the idea that one goes to Nibbana after death are only realizable if you're enlightened, like you can only know these things if you're enlightened. So Nibbana is only something you can know if you're enlightened. As a monk, I think that's what he's saying here, he or she, he. As a monk, did you just decide to accept Nibbana and reincarnation without any evidence? Evidence. Well, there's lots of evidence for reincarnation or rebirth, first of all. But, um, I, I, I mean, I can't talk about myself and where I am at, whether I'm, you know, this or that. But there are different levels. Even someone who hasn't seen Nibbana can have great faith, you know, but it still has to be faith. But they can have great faith based on the people that they uh, look up to. So, for example, my teacher, um, has f it's, it's the kind of thing where many people have lots of faith in him, even though they haven't become enlightened, they haven't real seen Nibbana for themselves. And that's simply because he's unlike anybody else. He's, he's got something that other people don't have, and, and people can feel it. Usually it's hard, for, if they haven't practiced meditation, it's hard for them to see it. But they get the idea that something's there. And they know that, that an ordinary person is not like this. It's not as kind, as generous, as uh, pure, as uh, un, unflappable, as um, constant and steady. And... imperturbable as this and so there's great faith there people who read the Buddha's teaching simply reading the, the Tipitaka gives you an incredible sense of awe and 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 inspiration and, and confidence in whoever it was who taught these things um, of course obviously much more so if you've actually practiced and realized them for yourselves but even without having done that it's, it, people become amazed when they see just how profound. I mean, this isn't like, the Buddhist teaching is nothing like the Bible, for example. It's nothing like the Christian Bible, nothing like it. They have very little in common, these two books, for example. Or take the, the Koran, very unsimilar. These, these, you might, you, I guess you'd have a better time comparing them to the Upanishads, for example. And they are in some ways similar to the Upanishads. But even the Upanishads, there is something m different with Buddhism. It's much more, well, we would say much sharper, much more mundane even, in the sense of simply dealing with the building blocks of reality. It doesn't have anything superfluous. It's not flowery. Uh, it's not designed to uh, enchant you. It's designed to wake you up. And so by reading this, many people have get faith. Uh, and I think that really just answers your question, because um, we accept reincarnation with lots of evidence, but we also accept... Sorry, but that's about Nibbana. I can say something else about reincarnation. But we accept Nibbana on these grounds. We accept that um, even though individually we may not have become enlightened, we accept that there's something special about this path. And so that leads us on. Now, ideally, that leads us on until we practice, and once we practice, then we see Nibbana for ourselves. And so it's, it's kind of like when you're walking through the forest and someone comes along who seems to know where they're going, and you, you watch them and you see that they know they can point out things and they know where how to avoid beasts and how to avoid pitfalls. So you say, wow, this person really knows this forest. Probably they're someone who could take me out of it. So you trust them. 
Um, and it doesn't mean you have blind faith in them and say, okay, well, I'm just going to sit here because I'm happy now. I found someone who, who knows this forest and can find the way out, so now I can rest in peace. Obviously, they don't do that. I mean, that's sort of the picture that you're painting, uh, or many people paint with still blind faith and so on. Well, that's blind faith. It's just sitting around and saying, well, he'll save us. You know, I'll just sit here until he gets me out of here. But that's not what you do. A person who believes in this person, they follow them, or they follow the path that this person points out and find the way out for themselves. They're hedging their bets because this person seems to be... It's, 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 it's like that with anyone. When you choose a teacher, you can only go by seems to be. In, until you know the person very, very well, you just go by what you can see and what you, you believe, and it can be wrong. But that's where we get the faith in there. But reincarnation, rebirth is, is actually different because on the first hand, on the, to the, on the first, in the first place, um, there is much evidence, not proof, but evidence. Remember, there's a difference. There's lots of evidence. There's no proof unless you remember a past life, but even then it's, you're not really proving anything because, of course, it can just be a fake memory. But, um, you know, the evidence of people pointing things out about their past lives, telling, oh, this was mine, and I know that, and I know this person, and calling people by their names, and things that they could never know. There's cases of that, you know, anecdotal cases still, but, but clinical cases. So there's, there's lots of well-documented cases. Um, and second of all, reincarnation is something that comes, you know, I've talked about this before, it's death that requires faith. And so we can actually turn the tables on people who say this sort of thing and say, well, what we know is cause and effect. We know that um, our experience now and how we react to it and interact with it affects the experience in the future. We know that that's the case. So extrapolating that ahead into the future is not a leap of faith. It's, a, it's the most obvious, um, it's the most parsimonious conclusion I got in real, a real heated argument with the materialists about this. He said that he, he ridiculed me and thought, you know, obviously they would ridicule this and say how ridiculous it is. But only if you've already taken as taken for granted that the material world is all there is. If you've already uh, accepted on faith, that or not even on faith, I suppose. Just, but it is kind of there is a jump there that um, this around us is real, that there is something, there are atoms and subatomic particles that actually somehow exist outside of experience. If you take that, and that is a leap of faith, uh, compared to the Buddhist concept of, of simply believing in what is experience, but like seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking, this you can believe in because it's there. No matter what it is that I'm seeing, you can't deny that there is the experience that is somehow best labeled as seeing, you know, as a, as a name and it's an experience. You can't deny that there's some experience there. That's, that's the most undeniable thing. Now, whether we're in the matrix hooked up to a machine or a brain in a vat, or whether we're actually in a three-dimensional reality, I'm actually in this room, that is something that you, you can't answer. Or it's less easy to answer and it's more of a leap of faith. So, so materialists do that. And this is what's required to um, to ha have this this idea that when the physical body dies, because the physical body exists and because it's the cause of the mind, two things which you haven't proved. Um, therefore, death equals the end of existence. Right. So you've actually taken leaps of faith there. Now, reincarnation doesn't require that. Reincarnation says what what we experience now just continues, which is in every case the most parsimonious answer. So based on Occam's razor, the, the law that if it's more complicated without any need, you cut, out, you cut it off in favor of uh, a more parsimonious answer or conclusion. So the most parsimonious is that what we experience now continues. Uh, and that's that there is no death. And so therefore the idea of rebirth, well how that works, that's more theory and, it's, and that's really speculation. So the idea that the mind uh, you know, creates a new body and there's a new, new being, uh, that we don't have proof of, but it is it's, it's still in line with the most parsimonious because it's what we observe. 
So we have to put these two things together. What we observe in, in experiential level and what we see in others. Oh, that being was born there, seeming out of nothing. Then we have the idea that they were reborn. And that is just theory. But um, point being that once we meditate, even if we haven't become enlightened, and, and reincarnation actually isn't prove, proven uh, when someone becomes a sotapanna or when becomes an arahant even. You don't prove it there. But you understand it and you realize why it's so reasonable once you start to meditate because you see how, how the mind works and how reality works, how reality really isn't based on the material world. It's based on experience. Once you see that, once you break through that and are able to just... Uh, it, just you know, let go of all these views and ideas and beliefs and concepts and just see things as they're experienced. Um, your, your whole paradigm shifts and the idea of rebirth is, is just the most reasonable, it's, it's just the most obvious answer.